hopefully we're going to go on there we go excellent it is working all right so far nobody watching hmm well um hopefully it's working the moment somebody shows up i'll know it's working Good. Okay. Hey, man. I see a couple of people. Good, Robert. Um, and you can sign in, Ashik. Um, good, man. This is great that we can do this uh, all the way from Mississippi to wherever the heck you guys are from. Bangladesh. Good. Um, I'm going to play a little bit. Looks like we've got 10 people. Please, uh, please sign in. Please say hello. So I'll have some sense of where you guys are from. And uh, it's working. That's the first thing I'll say is it's working. It took a while. Ultimately, I had to just reset the, the, it's not the modem, it's the thing that's sitting right here on the desk. And I'm, I had to actually relocate into the my kid's room. Um, but we got it going. So um, when I get a few more people, uh, we'll, I'll tell you what it's going to be about. But uh, you can kind of see that from the from the description in the video. Let me play a little bit more. I'm working on a, a B-flat harp. And uh, one of my favorite things to do is always to really wail on the harp, to really whap it hard. So... <laughs> Well, I see we got 25, 25 people. Um, so actually what I'm going to do is shift a little bit, maybe so that the live stream, because I'm seeing myself on a delay. All right, I'm going to quickly uh, take a quick look. South Carolina, great, great. South Carolina, Trevor, Benjamin, Sridhar. Oh, man, I'm bad with uh, with, with Indian names, but uh, you got to forgive me. I'm just a clueless American. Pip Productions, Luke, good, man, good. Mike, Aberdeen, I assume that's Aberdeen, Scotland, or is that Aberdeen, Mississippi? Holland, New Jersey. I was just in, uh, I just went through the Lincoln Tunnel the other day. Uh, I think that was on my way into the city. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about what I'm hoping to do, what I'm thinking about at this time of the year. Um, it is, today is the 30th of, of December. We got New Year's Eve tomorrow, and then we got New Year's Day. And a lot of people, I think, um, God, I'm looking at my central processing unit, 92%. So if this goes down, you know, I'm sorry about that. It looks like we're working working my poor thing pretty hard here. Um, the end of the year is a good time to reflect on what you've achieved during the year. And the beginning of the year is a good time to try new things. And uh, sometimes what people try at the beginning of the year, they say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something this year that I've never done before. So maybe some of you are beginners. I see I'm taking a quick look. Greetings from Germany. Egypt, Scotland, 
this is great. You know, I may have to occasionally, if Donald Trump gets too freaking crazy, I may have to occasionally come on and just kind of let you guys vent about my country. Back when I when I was a busker in Paris the first time in the summer of 1984, and then again in '86, one thing that that was those were the years of Reagan. Everybody remember Ronald Reagan? And it was my first experience as an American traveling overseas and being held accountable for the president of my country. It's a strange thing to be a street musician, but when I would meet, you know, musicians are the ones who kind of hold the whole thing together. We know that, right? We know that we're holding it together. When it gets, starts to get crazy, we're the peacemakers, we're the, the music that soothes the savage breast, you know that, uh, that saying? Anyway, good time for beginnings, good time for reflecting. And so I'm gonna, I wanna give you a few little off-the-cuff comments about, about beginnings and endings. I, I haven't thought this through. And then I wanna take some questions and actually answer your questions. So, um, let's say that you're, so beginners will go second. The people who are thinking about starting the harmonica maybe, or thinking about really getting serious, do second. First would be, what's your year been like? And I'll go back and look at comments. If you wanna make comments in the, in the, uh, in the chat, I'll, I'll go back and take a look. Um, what's your year been like with harmonica? One, I remember being at a phase early on with harmonica where I would get to the point pretty easily where after, I, if I, let's say I found a guy who was playing guitar and I jammed with him. After about three choruses, I felt like I played every single thing I knew. Have you ever been to that place? So what's, let me just, let's address that. Let's imagine that you're somebody who, you've, you've got your basic licks, but you're tired of them. You kind of need something new. So the best way, actually, I'm gonna best way of getting something new here. I'm gonna I'm gonna move in midstream, and I'm gonna give you a really important concept. Um, it's something you can do the moment this is over. You can do it right now if you want, which is to get a blank sheet of paper and a pen. One question I ask people in my clinics when I do clinics is, what's your song list? Now, what's amazing is blues harmonica players, we often get to the place where we, we say, well, I don't really, you know, do songs. I mean, I, I just I jam on blues. But that's not good enough. And here's why. The average person in the street who doesn't play harmonica but who's willing to indulge you if you play harmonica, the first question they're going to have for you, apart from do you play anything else, the first question they're going to have is, can you play me a song? Or they may just say, play me a song. If you don't have a song ready to go, if you don't have that thing you do, I mean a song, a song, then you're not fulfilling the obligation that a harmonica player has. So what might your song be? Well, when I start blues harmonica players off, I, as beginners, I always start them off with Oh Susanna. And my theory is sort of the, the, the you want the, the, the folks in the bar who clap on two, one and three, I made a mistake on the easiest song, right? So you've got to have something with a groove, but you've got to have a song list. So I challenge you right now, think about what song is number one on your list and make sure that you don't go to this new year. You don't get past midnight on New Year's Eve without creating a song list and saying, if my wife or girlfriend kicked me out and I was on the street, that's never happened to me, but I've played on the street a lot. I can talk about that. What would my first thing be? And what would I call it? So it might just be a jam. That's not really good enough, but I will be honest. I had song lists like that that had just sort of, you know, boogie woogie in, in, in C, right? But that's something you've got to do. And I think you need to start to think about what kinds of songs might the general public like to hear? Well, in terms of blues songs, this, this is tricky. And, I, you know, for me, the, the great song is St. Louis Blues, St. Louis Blues. Um, and it helps if you overblow, but I'll play a little bit of that now just to give you a sense because it's the world's most popular and well-known blues song. Here's a C harp. Oh, I'm 
rusty. I better I better stop that right now. The point is, that's that's a song you could do. Now it has a bridge, a minor bridge. Um, let me. I want to pause for a sec. I want to take a quick look. I see this chat thing. I'm going to go backwards. Playing okay. Playing since October 2015. Benjamin says lots of plateaus. That's so that, that I will go back and I'll look and I'll just address some of these things. Plateaus. Plateaus. So a plateau is when you you have a comfort zone. You got what you can do, and it's time to get out of that comfort zone if you want to get past the plateau. To get out of your comfort zone, mean well, how, what, how might one do that? So one way to do that might be to do something you should do a little bit of every day, which is to listen to music, recorded music, find the right key harmonica, and do your best to copy it. I did a lot of that when I was learning. Even if you don't get all of it, even if, now this is important, even if you only manage to get one lick, um, you will have, if one new lick, you will have begun the process of getting out, off your plateau because you'll be thinking musically, you'll, you'll be developing new synapses. I think plateaus are all about a comfort zone. So you, you have to get out of that comfort zone and you have to you have to appreciate the fact that you've got a comfort zone because people, some people who are learning don't have a comfort zone. They haven't gotten enough accrued talent to get in a comfort zone. Okay, so you should appreciate that you've got something enough that you've got a plateau. Um, here's a challenge. Let me just, I'm going to throw some of these out at you. Here's a challenge. Um, I will, I'll challenge each of you on your own to make sure that you know how to play along with a 12-bar blues progression. In fact, that you can play solo. I'll do that right now. I'll do two choruses. I sort of did this a little bit at the beginning, but I'll try to show you what I mean. And that you get four beats to a bar and 12 bars to a chorus. That's 48 beats. I challenge you to get to the place where you can just play along and you can you can play improvise or or play something patterned so that you've got exactly those 48 beats. I find that that's actually a dividing line between sort of maybe intermediate and advanced intermediate players. Seems to me that intermediate players often can make bluesy sounds. They can probably jam along if the band is there behind them or a jam track. But if you get the if I, and I'll do this often with big, with with students who come to me. I'll say, I want you to play me a 12-bar blues. Play me a chorus or two and give me 48 beats. Play it so that I can hear the changes. So let me show you what I mean. Here's one way of doing that. And here's what you can do. You can, you can tap. I'll tap as I do it. beats. You can go back and count it. I just played in the simplest possible way. I kind of did an A line, an A line repeated. I kind of I did almost the same thing the second time through. And the third time, it sounded sort of like the first two, but with some slight variations. This is very important, very important. Um, but there's many ways of carrying your sway through a 12-bar blues. That was one. Here's another. And again, so that you can imply the changes. Here's the simplest possible way. Now the change. Alright, again, I, so one way of escaping a plateau is to go for a certain kind of precision, to go for because it may be that you're making bluesy sounds. It may be that you're the kind of player who can jam along fairly successfully with the band. But when you're left by yourself, you're the the girlfriend or the wife's kick out, or the or the boyfriend if you're if I have a female or two here, hopefully, um, you're on the street. You know, we're you gonna you're gonna be random kind of. I've seen people like that. I saw a guy in Central Park playing a guitar that was not tuned about a week and a half ago as I was jogging through 
trying to make a buck. I mean, that, but we want to do it right. You want to get better. One way of getting better is to make sure that you've got the discipline to notch that progression. Here's a couple of more ways. Another one. Whoa, I blew a change in there. I blew a change. Could you tell? If I didn't tell you, well, some of you could figure that out. I did something that wasn't quite kosher. Anyway, pause for the cause. Pause for the cause. I'm going to go back. I'm going to look to see some of what you guys... Listen here. Oh, thank you, man. Russia! Good! My friend, I've got relatives from Russia. I've got relatives in Russia, in Kharkov, in Minsk, um, and, and uh, in Brooklyn. <laughs> People who came over. Okay, my grandfather emigrated. Um, from the U.S. Virgin Islands. All right. From many years ago, I, uh, I, I was in uh, Sapphire Bay, Virgin Islands. Um, okay, B-flat. Nice to play single notes. Southern California. Essex, U.K., my God, don't ask me to drive on those roads. Oh, my God. Tough driving on the wrong side of the, the road. Scottish Highlands, Egypt. Boy, uh, Abd, Abdul, Abdul Rahman, I wish I could visit your wonderful country at some point. It seems like right now is a tough time. Um, a tough time, just uh, it's a tough time, right? We're all living in a tough time, which is maybe why blues harmonic is a good thing to do. Sweden, Albany, Smallbany, okay, upstate. Upstate Australia or Austria, all over the world. Overblows. Lucas said something about overblows. The Alley Cat. Thank you, man. Thank you. From Southbound. Um, wait a minute. Good. Oh, Abdul Rahman. Okay. So you ran out of stuff to sing. So I'm a runner. One of the ways to get lyrics uh, in your head is to groove them while you're jogging. So if any of you go out and jog, what I'd suggest is that you listen to a piece of music before you go, and maybe even have your lyric sheet, if you're trying to memorize a song, and then say the, sing the lyrics in your head as you're out there running. I find that a very effective way to get, but you have to put in the work, and it's tough for me, because I'm, I'm aging, the brain cells are going. Um, plateaus, um, uh, okay, rope-a-dope, uh -huh. CZ would be Czechoslovakia, I guess, or the Czech Republic. Or is that Poland? Void Voltec, I am not sure. Um, St. Louis Blues. What's a bridge? What's a bridge? Let me let me let's talk about a, a little music, a little freeform music stuff. So a bridge in a song. In, in, in the old days in America, we had Tin Pan Alley, which was a, a street in New York where all the professional songwriters worked. They churned out a whole lot of pop music. And the classic American pop song had chorus, or it had verse, verse, then chorus, then verse. Um, sometimes that, that third thing, chorus might be a kind of a bridge. A bridge is something that where the changes are very different than, than, than the normal kind of verses. So a good example um, would be uh, St. Louis Blues, which, has, which is... A 12-bar blues, then another 12 bars, then it has a, a minor chorus that's, I think, 16 bars. So let me play a 12 bar, 12 bars of St. Louis blues. Let me play the, the bridge. I'll call it the bridge. It's a minor bridge or a minor, could call it a chorus. St. Louis woman and her diamond ring. So here's the head. And I'll do it quick.
got got the St. Louis blues. So it's a minor, and in fact, you know what? I'm I'm really kind of a lazy musician, so for a long time I sort of half knew the song, and I didn't actually feel completely comfortable on the bridge. One of the reasons I do the things that I do when I play it, I'm looking at my CPU, 94%. I just hope we don't overheat here. I really hope. Um, am I still there? You still getting this stream? It says active stream is healthy. Good, good, good. Um, it's really important, you know, here's, here's something for those of you who are sort of in that solid, intermediate, advanced, intermediate. Make, make a resolution this year that you're going to take some song that you've always sort of half known, that you could maybe, if you had a gig, you could kind of limp through it um, behind the guitar player and the bass player, but you don't really know it. You don't really have complete confidence. You can't really carry it. Um, for me... A song like that was Georgia, and please don't ask me to play Georgia solo right now. But but one way to learn the song is to get two or three different versions. And this is actually, if you're taking notes, I would take a note on that because this is what my teacher Nat Riddles taught me how to do. If you're going to learn St. Louis blues, get first of all see if there's a harmonica player who did it. Um, and actually, Big Walter Horton threw it into one of his songs and didn't call it St. Louis blues. You know why? because he would have had to pay royalties. Uh, and so sometimes you'll, you'll find these weird things that you say, I know that melody. So I, I learned it first as something that was in a big Walter Horton version of something else. Um, get two or three different versions and then ask what they have in common. Um, Georgia, Paul Osher has a fantastic version of Georgia on my mind. I learned Georgia when the Blues Doctors decided to do it. Um, and I'm not gonna play it now. I'm not gonna play probably because I'd mess it up. What I learned about Georgia um, is that it, you have to kind of delay it. There's like a delay, a delay thing. Georgia, Georgia, oh, wrong key. Anyway, I'm not going to play Georgia right now, but I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you what I'll do. Okay, I'm looking this. Can you give some tips on how to play faster, quicker? Um, yeah, I can. Um, and I'll, so I'll give you a very important concept when you're thinking about speed and how to, and how to play faster. First thing is, it, when I'm playing fast, I'm playing lip pursed. I'm not doing a tongue block. Now, Sugar Blue plays everything tongue blocked. Um, that's not fast. Um, I play lip pursed, especially because overblows, which I throw in, are much easier. So let me let me do some. Here's a sort of warm-up. I think I call this Adam's warm-up exercise with overblows. Um, I'm not sure. Now, here's, here's a key thing about speed. You have to have a groove, and you can't start at full speed. You ha and in fact, you have to have control at a lesser speed. It's very important to develop. So my, my, what I would say is, and, and, and you have to know what the groove is, and you have to know what you're trying for. So there's a certain rhythmic precision that I think is extremely important. And all good jazz players have it. I think rock players aren't always quite as connected to the, to the beat in the same way. Um, Sometimes, I, I often feel this, that there's certain kinds of blue souls, as opposed to a guy like Albert Collins, who always knows exactly on guitar where the beat is. Um, let, me, um, let me show you what I mean. So, do you want to get fast on triplets, or do you want to get fast on sixteenth notes? Two very different ways of approaching. Triplets, I, I listened to Paul Butterfield uh, on the Muddy Waters Woodstock album. That was my first experience. Um, a song called Too Many Drivers, for example. Um, and and he, did a, he did a version of um, I'm Gonna Take You Downtown, uh, Gone to Main Street with Muddy Waters. That, that was the one, for me, that showed me how to play fast triplets. So you want to get faster. Uh, let's say I've got a C harp here. Um, obviously, you have to have the notes to play. So the first kind of thing might be to, to work with the blue scale. Descending riffs are probably easier, but let's let's pick a let's pick a simple riff and let's pick a triplet riff. So let's take bent four draw to four draw to five draw. 
Um, that hopefully that's that's a familiar riff to, to many of you. Now it means nothing if you don't have if you don't know where the beat is, where the downbeat is. And so I would get a metronome. For me, that's a perfectly comfortable that's a perfectly comfortable tempo. For some of you, that might be too fast, and you might need to. I don't know. If, can you hear me? I'll, if I go like. A, So as you start to try to develop speed, what you're really talking about is you're developing endurance, right? You're developing lips to lip strength to not lose your embouchure as you maintain speed. Um, and the first sign that I haven't been practicing is that I get a little uh, tired, that kind of ring of tiredness around my lips. You know that what that that is? That kind of that's the sign that your chops are just not really in shape. And so once you've been playing and practicing every day. 15 minutes in the morning, 15 at night, a half hour in the morning, a half hour at night, build up to that, you won't have that, that'll go away. Then you're prepared to actually work on speed. So you want to have your, your, your tempo, get a metronome. I don't like them, but they're useful for comparing, for, for figuring out your progress, right? Get a metronome, figure out what tempo you're playing at when you're playing comfortably. Make sure you're tapping your foot along with the metronome. Take a breath every now and then, because that's all draw. Then what you want to do is you want to push it. You want to push the tempo to the point where it falls apart, where you can't do it smoothly. And then what you, and find out what tempo is that on your metronome. Then back off, back off the speed. Uh, 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 you know, five beats a second, five beats a, a minute, beat per minute, five beats a minute. And that should hopefully be your sort of maximum comfortable tempo. You may need to back off a little more. And bit by bit, you want to you want to work those three levels. You want to work the sort of easy, like I can do it. I can fall out of bed and do this tempo, right? And the 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 the, the fastest what I call like fastest aerobic pace. Your sort of fastest thing that you can do without losing it. And then what's a little bit above that? And you want to. What you're trying to do is, is work those three levels to develop speed. Um, you also obviously have to have licks to play. One, and then here's something interesting. When you've worked at your, when you've worked up to your sort of fastest comfortable level, then back the, the metronome down by 10 or 15 beats a minute. And if you do that, what you can then do, especially if you're trying to move on the harp, and I'll show you what I mean. If you're trying to move on the harp, you can begin to think musically and, and actually get to the point where you're really thinking creatively and you've got enough time to think. Because you can't do that when you're moving really fast. You're just kind of working on reflex. When you back down, you can begin to have musical ideas. So if I'm... Here's what I might try if I were you. Again, we're talking triplets. Um, go with this tempo. Now, I wouldn't have been able, that very last thing I did, whatever it was that I did, at a, but at that slow tempo for me, I can actually I can, I, I can, my mind will say, I can do that lick, right? As opposed to, well, I can't go for that because I'm not, I, can't, I don't, that's not in my repertoire. You can begin to pull new things into your repertoire at that tempo. Does that make sense? I'm delighted I've got 55 of you now. I love, really, this is great. Um, so that's, that is a long answer to a, to a good question. I better take some more questions, but that, but that's how I would work with those three tempos. The, the, the sort of relaxed, there's actually four tempos. So there was this sort of basic, that's my easy tempo, I can do that. There's the fastest plausible tempo, the fastest one I can hold today. There's the developmental tempo a little bit above that where you begin to fall apart. And then there's the one where you back down below your sort of easy everyday tempo, right? And that's the one where you actually consciously go slow, but in, in the groove, and you begin to try new things. And I think when you do that, let me, let's see if this works. Let me, let me show you those four tempos for me. Um, so, and let me work on the, the high notes, actually. Let me try from sort of the six hole. So 
So that's actually my everyday easy. Now, what's the fastest? Uh, now, at the end, I want to show you something that I did. If you go back and play this, because I make these kinds of experiments all the time where I'm just free blowing and I'll tape myself, or at least I used to, I don't do enough these days, and I'll tape myself, and when I come across something interesting, I'll go back and go, what did I, what was that? That's a way of actually unearthing or discovering new things. What's incredible is, as long as I've been playing, more than four decades, there are still sort of obvious things that I come across when I do that exercise. Um, but, but I want you to notice one other thing, is that I was the way that I think about improvising, whether it's high notes or low notes, is I think about little transient kind of internal dialogues, internal call and response. Um, so I ended up moving into something I'll try to, it's impossible to recreate. So dun 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 became kind of the rhythmic background of a melody. And then I simply moved that dun 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 boom boom ba da bum bum. Right? It's, maybe it's more of a jazz player's way of thinking um, than a blues way of thinking, but it's one of the things that I carry with me in my toolkit in an improvisational way. You know, and I want to I take another uh, question. Um, dedicated harp player, Benjamin Good, and I, your name is familiar to me. Um, fantastic that you're, that you're here. Let me, uh, let me take, a, take a quick look. Uh, <laughs> how to jam and just create new music on the spot. Um, you know what, Abdurrahman, I'm going to get back to you. Um, do they call you Abe? Is that an okay American thing? Um, somebody asks, I wonder if there's any news on a release date for the Satan and Adam doc. There's a documentary about my duo, Satan and Adam. Um, and the answer is there's no, there's no, there's really good news. The good, there's, there's, there's a big name kind of Hollywood, there's a guy, the guy who's producing the documentary, um, has partnered with it with uh, a guy who's won two uh, Oscars for documentary um, soundtracks. So you'd think Satan and Adam, we've got enough music of our own, but a documentary needs a soundtrack, and this guy's going to write the soundtrack. Um, and there's a big name Hollywood studio that's that's uh, really interested in kind of helping finish this thing off. So it's going to happen. I realize I've been saying that for 20 years. It is going to happen. Um, and it's going to happen in 2017. But whether it's going to be the in theatrical release whether it's just going to debut in a couple of film festivals and then sort of end up in 2018. But I, something big and momentous will happen in 2018. Uh, in 2017, excuse me. But there's no there's no release date. Um, let me go back. Um, thanks, Gabe, for uh, loving my videos. Um, Emily, uh, uh, Amelia, Amelia um, effective routine to improve my skills. Um, let me talk a little bit about that. So... For most people, uh, you know, some people have lives organized so that they can practice a at will. They can they, they have all the time they need. They can take a day and, and play all day. Um, I had a few of those days when I was a younger man and not doing much, um, but I don't have that kind of life now. Um, I think the most important thing, here's a suggestion that I have. I'm a writer too, and when I really need to get writing done and when I've been most successful in getting it done, I've actually written a schedule. When I wrote a memoir about this Mr. Satan and my experience with him, I was in graduate school and I had to write in between taking graduate classes and writing graduate papers. And I said, I had a contract. Thank goodness. So, And somebody wanted it. And I wrote a 450-page book in 15 months in graduate school. The way I did that was I said, I'm going to write every day. And I'm going to do you know, one hour and four hours, minimum of one hour. And, and it made a huge difference to write, I, and I'm going to schedule it, I'm going to write it down. So one, th one way to do this, if you say, I, I would just urge you to try it, maybe for the first week of the new year, which is, if you got a calendar, I'm, I got a calendar, I'd write stuff down on the calendar, the year, to, week at a month at a glance, so write down when you're going to do it, I mean, and, and hold to it. It doesn't have to be that long. The key thing is it has to be every day. Uh, or most days. And the reason for that, and it's not obvious, is that your unconscious is doing a lot of the learning. 
You can't, and you know this, it's called latent learning. When you wake up in the morning and maybe you suddenly you can do something you couldn't do the day before, that's because your unconscious was working on it all night. When I first started playing with Sterling McGee, and we'd play for three or four hours on the street, I'd wake up in the morning and I'd be buzzing with music. Literally, the melodies were going through my head all night, and I'd have the song. So what I would say is start with a minimum of 15 minutes twice a day. I don't know anybody who can't find that. You can get that in the morning if you set your alarm. 15 minutes. I think the morning is a great time. Why is that? Why, do, why would I say 15 minutes in the morning is important? Because then your mind's working on it all day when you're doing something else. Right? Um, and then 15 minutes when you get home, later, later in the day at some point. It could be during lunch if you, if you live in the right location and you can hide from your office mates out in a park somewhere. Um, 15 minutes twice a day. That, to me, if you do that, you're at least maintaining. I think ideally about an hour a day. And I've heard some people just say that, that you have to do several different things when you're practicing. And one of them is do some listening. You can't learn how to play blues harmonica if you're not listening to good blues harmonica. The best metaphor here is how are you going to learn French better if you're reading books uh, and trying to talk French in an empty room? Or you're going to learn it if you go to Paris and you have to talk to somebody to get a cup of coffee. You're going to learn it much better there. You're going to really own what you know. Um, I think you need to, and you also need to be hearing those Parisian speakers in your all the time, right? So you need to have the music cycling through you, and you need to try to copy it, play along with it. I'm looking at this. I'm thinking I got 32% of my battery. But anyway, that that's what I would do. Is is 15 in the morning, 15 at night, or half hour in the morning, half hour at night. Break it up, give your, and do it as many days in a row as you can, and that will lead to your, your unconscious mind being your ally and working for you. Um, let me, okay, I'm going to take another one. When I play four draw band, four draw feels like I'm fighting against the harmonica, as if being stuck in molasses. How do you make it sound so light? Ah, very good question. Um, Now, you know, the, the tricky thing with harmonica is, it's, and this is a C harp again, um, the tricky thing is, is diagnosing it at a distance. So I'm trying to think. Uh, it, it feels heavy. Um, so it's really important to make sure that even as you are doing, well, first of all, you may be attempting to bend in a different way than I bend. Um, when I bend the four, it, there's several different ways that I might do it. Really what I'm doing there is I am raising my tongue close to the roof of my mouth, uh, which is constricting the airstream. And when you constrict the airstream in order to create the bend, which you sort of have to do, you have to constrict it somewhere in your mouth or your throat. When you do that, potentially you, you may feel, if, you're, if, you, if, if you don't kind of know what you're going for or if you're still learning, you may feel like you're cutting the airstream off entirely. Um, I feel this way more on the, the lower harps, I guess. And of course, if you don't have a good harp, you're, you're going to feel that way. Um, if your tongue is really far forward, and I just did that. If you go really far forward uh, with your tongue, um, you're kind of you're kind of getting yourself into a corner where you're not, there's not a whole lot of airstream that you're going to be able to work on. Um, so I, I would urge you to to try not to go with your tongue too far forward, right? Not don't constrict it. So that's that's what I'm doing there. I'm I'm getting a much too flattened mouth. The the, the air the pocket of air in my mouth is too um, what's the word? It's too constricted. So start by getting a good, clear four draw with no bend. I think that's the key thing. Make sure you can drop your jaw. Notice my jaw up. Even if I'm not bending. Now I can use that if, I'm, if I change the shape of my mouth correctly. I can use that to do what I call scooping. Which is to say, I'm getting the bend by lifting my jaw and 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 getting my tongue close to the closer to the roof of my mouth.
but I can also do that simply by moving my tongue. I don't have to move my jaw, but I would experiment. A lot of what this is about is about troubleshooting, a lot of troubleshooting when you're trying to troubleshoot your technique is about saying what are the variables and what variable am I not even aware of? So part of troubleshooting is about relaxing, number one, because if you're tense, you're not going to get it. Relaxing, using your head, saying, I got to, um, what could I be doing differently here? Um, is there more than one way? Now, John Gindick teaches people, and if this works too, to say key coup if you want to bend. Key coup. And when you go coup, drawing in, that works. That gives you, what it does is it's a little more staccato, a little more percussive. Um, anyway, that's a, let me, let me um, go and take a look at some other, other questions. Um, woo, okay. Um, uh, okay, Matthew Given says, I enjoyed your video on holding the harp right, but I hold with my right hand and not upside down. Okay. So why did I say, I was talking about holding the harp, and I was saying, I hold with my left hand. Most people do. And I said, there's a few people who hold, hold the harp with their right hand. They tend to hold it upside down. Why did, why did I say that? I never really explained why. The reason for that is because the low notes, the one, two, three, the being the low notes, are the ones that benefit most from having this cavity here. If I turn it upside down and still hold it the same way, And, and, and of course, at this point, I'm on this side, right? Not, not this song. I'm not getting much of a wah wah on that. Now, I might get a great wah wah on the nine draw. So actually, you know, if I could play it like that, you'd get some incredible wah wah stuff on the high notes. But the, the wah though, you can get that on holding it the right way. And that's the campfire sound, right? This sort of. But the rest of the reason you want to have the, you want to have the low notes on this wherever this is. So if I'm holding it this way, I want. <laughs> I can't. I don't. I can't hold it backwards. So um, let me take a look. Left hand players. Okay. Recommend, uh, uh, okay, Shkoko, you went now. I, I said the last question you were going to answer, but you've got a lot of good questions. Recommend three people for me to listen to. All right, this is a great question. Three people. Um, now, most people in my position, most harmonica teachers, blues harmonica teachers, would have those three names be blues harmonica players. They might say Little Walter, Sonny Boy Williamson, and Sonny Terry. Those, and you might say that those are respectively, let's go in reverse, Sonny Terry being kind of the great uh, uh, Piedmont style acoustic player, Sonny Terry. Sonny Boy Williamson, I'm here, I'm talking about Rice Miller, um, was a master of the, the low harp, the high harp. He really didn't play amplified very much in his recordings, a little bit, um, but he had a distinctive style that was incredibly influential. And then, of course, Little Walter, the great Little Walter. It's hard not to preface it with that. So if, if, you, if that's the way some people might answer this, I, I could answer it like that, and I would say those are all really important players. But I would suggest that at least one of the players that you listen to, one of, and one of the musicians, not be a harmonica player. Um, I played electric, I picked up electric guitar and harmonica when I was 16 at the same time. So I think about harmonica very much like a guitar player. And the best thing I ever did, apart from learning how to play blues guitar, which helped me think about blues harmonica, uh, and helped me talk chords when I'm talking with the guitar player, I can demonstrate, right? But I went to a, a, a jazz school for seven weeks and learned some jazz chords. And that changed the way that I think harmonically about music. It gave me just a little bit of a jazz tinge. This is the advantage, you see. The problem with just playing the harmonica is there's a lot of musical education that, that really would be helpful that you don't get. And I would say, um, so if there's one, if there's one guitar, blues, I might listen to a blues guitar player and a blues sax player. So if I were to give you five players, I'd give you those three harmonica players. But then I might give you the two, the two who are in some ways the most important to me. Well, 
i want to add two guitar players bb king because he had an incredible sense of economy in his playing he's also very jazzy um but an incredible sense of those micro tones the way that you um um the way that you sort of roll pitches off um the other guitar player that i loved and that was very important i think that if a, if a harmonica player could copy his style you'd have something and his sound you'd really have something exciting and that's albert collins the most explosive kind of angular he plays with his fingers he plays uh with a d chord capoed up on a on a telecaster the icy sound and i would go and investigate albert collins and then try to copy some of his stuff see if you can get any of it copy frosty and then sax i think sax sax players the great advantage see i'm in love or i was in love with a couple of different sax players sounds one was a guy named houston person a big tenor with a little bit of reverb the fact that i like to play with reverb is partly because of houston person that's p-e-r-s-o-n um, there's a song you can find on youtube uh, on probably on youtube called goodness um, it was a, a song by him that was on an album called the blues tenor sax and I, it's a it's a slow blues i copied his licks hank crawford was the other person um, who, who uh, i copied a lot he played with uh, uh, Ray Charles, um, David Fathead Newman, Hank Crawford. These are guys who play kind of the bluesy side, the bluesy R&B side of jazz sax. And he does a lot of licks you can copy. Great sound. The great advantage of listening to somebody other, if you're a blues harmonica player, why would you listen to non-blues harmonica players? Because you can fall in love with their sound, you can copy their licks, you can get new stuff, and no matter how much you copy their licks, you're never going to sound just like them. And but you're going to be doing something a little different than the than most blues harmonica players, and that was the key for me. Um, here's a here's a so Hank Crawford. Um, now there's a riff that I that I learned decades ago, but that that's a riff that doesn't sound like a blues harmonica player's riff, and yet it fits perfectly on the harp. sax players do some of the same licks we do but they kind of turn them inside out sometimes and so there's things they do um anyway that's that's what i would do you know what guys i've got about a few minutes left um working on any bl new blues based fiction ah ted you're here no i'm not i'm, ne I'm never going to try to write another novel but i will let me encourage since you've mentioned it guys you can go out to amazon right now and check out a novel that i did write about a young guy whose girlfriend cuckolds him in new york he's a graduate student at columbia sort of happened to me um and uh, he goes off to europe with some harmonicas resolving basically to get even to get revenge which is to say to have the the wildest possible month that he can have on the streets of europe and he does he has a wild time with a guitar player named billy lee grant it's called busker's holiday and you can find it on amazon and let me can i give a, a brief commercial if you haven't already done so please subscribe to this channel now that i figured out that i can actually make wirecast play 6.0.7 work i'm going to be doing more of this um uh, and when in doubt by the way do what they teach you to do with your mac right which is just reboot i just turned the the router on and everything worked fine um I do have a book coming out uh, next September, but I don't want to talk about it until it's almost happening. It's not fiction, it's scholarship, but I will, I'll wait on that. Um, tongue, let me see. Uh, when to add the spice, yes. Playing for a few months. Um, can't seem to get out of a rut. I think this will be a last, I've been going for 49 minutes, and thanks to all of you who've hung in there. Um, can't seem to get out of a rut where I don't feel like I'm improving. Is it just a mental barrier? I sort of started with this. Maybe I should end with this. So action item for 2017. You are each going to get a sheet of paper and a pen, and you're going to make a song list, right? And something's number one. Something's the first song on your song list. The song you can pull out when somebody says, oh, you play harmonica, play me a song. What's that song? It doesn't have to be a blues. 
but it has to have a groove. It has to have some rhythmic solidity, maybe some snap. Could be a slow, a slow blues, but it's got to have a groove. You've got to be able to tap your foot somehow, keep the beat, and play it. And then you've got to add songs. And I would say one way of getting out of a rut is start to add songs. Say, I'm going to learn a song. Uh, I'm going to learn a new song. Um, you know what? My back, my Mac is getting real low here. Um, it says low battery close. Okay, um, guys, I've got to go. Uh, I may do a little of this tomorrow. It's possible. New Year's Eve. Maybe we'll have a follow up if I have a little time, um, and I will alert you uh, by way of uh, a kind of whatever you, whatever I did on this video to say it's it's coming on. I'll do that next time. In fact, I'll try to do that from now on. Um, thank you very much. Please subscribe to this channel if you would. Um, I see there's a fan funding thing. You can actually throw a bucket. Well, you could throw a bucket at me, I suppose. I don't know how that works. Um, but no need to do that. That's that's uh, that's strictly optional. Um, and tell your friends. Um, check out my website, Modern Blues Harmonica. It's been uh, it's been fun. Um, there's something really big that I'm going to be part of next year. I can't talk about it, but it's going to be with some other teachers. Um, a big a big event. So uh, look forward to some really cool things in 20. 17 and uh, I'll see you down the road. Okay, I'm going to try